This episode is brought to you by Arden Labs Education. Sign up today to learn advanced concepts in Go, Docker, Kubernetes, Terraform, and more. Visit ardenlabs.com forward slash education for more information. Welcome to the Arden Labs podcast and our special guest today is Toby Weingartner, also AKA, I have to say it, the, the Nutty Swiss. I love that handle, by the way. I just love it. Every time it pops up on my on my Twitter feed, I, I, I smile because I know something good's coming out of there. I, I really do love your feed, T Toby. I, I think it's awesome. Thank you. It's uh, been a lot of fun, I guess, is the best way to put it. Things have changed, obviously, in the recent past, but uh, I don't even know how long my feed's been up now. My guess is, I don't know, 15 years or something. Wow, so you're like early, early Twitter doctor. Sort of weird way. I think I got on Twitter, I, I want to say sometime before I joined Twitter, um, but I didn't, I didn't really use it until I, I actually uh, was working at Twitter for a little while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm really excited to talk to you. I think it's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun. So, so give everybody the two minute elevator pitch on what Toby's doing today. So right now I work at Google. I'm uh, part of a team called Traffic Control. I take care of a system called GSLB. Um, stands for Global System Load Balancer. So pretty much a good chunk, if not all, of the internal load balancing that Google does. Um, the dev team are the ones that write the code and, and I'm on the SRE side. So I try and make sure that things keep running and, you know, we maintain our nines and basically keep all of our customers happy. That's in a nutshell what I work on. The rest of the time, I enjoy driving a nice car, um, and bum around some of the hills around here. The SRE, S I, I, I've had a couple guests recently that are SREs. And um, if you've heard the other shows and you've heard me say that I, I find that position fascinating, not anything I want to do, man. I, I am not an ops guy, want nothing to do with ops. I love people like you, Toby, because I don't want to do nothing of it. But I, I do, <laughs> you don't like it. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's, it's not that I don't like it. I, I enjoy most of my job. Um, I don't look at it as ops. A lot of the things... Um, if it's uh, ops related, meaning I look at, at ops as sort of toil, right? It's something you use your hands and you get something done and you don't set up a lot of automation or other stuff like that. I mostly actually work directly with the developers to change the design of systems, to re-architect them, to make them more reliable. You use statistics and math to figure out, does it make sense? Does it not? And yes, there is some toil involved in terms of like, whoops, we got paged. We got to figure out what's going on and dig in and mitigate and stuff like that. Um, that's the side of the work that I have enjoyed a lot in the past. And I'm trying to do a little less of today just because as I get um, older, uh, I'm not, you know, you don't necessarily want that immediate stress constantly in your life. You you prefer to just say, you know what, it's okay. I'll let the people who really want that stress uh, go ahead. Handle it. And, yeah, and, and they thrive in it. If, if you want that type of thing, you tend to thrive in it. Whereas if you're looking more for a, I hate almost saying laid back, because <laughs> our team is not laid back on any of that front. We, we have a... We have a uh, page response time of like somebody at the keyboard with an effective within five minutes, but that means you need to acknowledge your page within two minutes. And then, you know, if you don't, your secondary does. And if they don't, then everybody gets type of page. So it's very high pressure, I guess. In some sense. Yeah, I, 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 I was doing some of that stuff early in my career. And I guess when I was young, it was, uh, it was exciting. Hey, there's a problem. Let's jump in there and solve it. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you, dude. I'm like, like yeah, I'm over that. I, somebody else take care of it. But I've never heard of someone say they were like in, in an SRE role and then kind of helping with architecture and design and 
and, and those types of things. I fi- see. I would love to do that. What you're talking about I, is like in my wheelhouse. It's 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 weird because you you meet different people in in this field. Um, my background, if you know, I I can get into a slight bit of that. No, no, we're not, don't, don't don't get into that. You know what? Let's 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 stop this conversation for a second. This was this was good. This was good. I I, I want to get you in the time machine. And I, I want to get there. So, so, so a couple of things, Toby. Um, first of all, did you grow up in the U.S.? And if so, did you grow up in the U.S.? I did not. No. Uh, Where'd you grow up? So I was born in Switzerland. Maybe that's the reason for a nutty Swiss. I grew up in Canada and Switzerland. So my family emigrated to Canada when I was 10 years old. And then, you know spent some time between both countries because my immediate family, my mom, dad, brother, sister, so on, were in Canada. Um, Anybody else really was mostly in Switzerland. And then what year was it when you graduated uh, high school there in Canada? Um, I knew you were going to ask me that question. And funny enough, that's the only... Uh, <laughs> that's the only year that I sort of had to scratch my head on because all the other ones I won't know. I believe it was in 91. 91, 91. Okay. That's a good year. That's a good year. It brings you closer to me. Uh, lately, everybody's been saying like 2009, 2010. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, I feel comfortable in the 90s there, man. That's that's good stuff. So that's like when you're like 17, 18 there, um, 90. See, 91 is the year I graduated from university. So so you're just like four years behind me, man. It's all good. Yeah, university, uh, I've had a bit of a different university career. Yeah, don't talk, don't talk to me about university. Yeah, don't, talk, oh, don't, don't, don't jump ahead of me, Toby. All right? I got to reel you in here. Good, I want to talk, about, I want to talk about the, the, the high school days to start. But, but uh, you know my favorite question, because you've, you've listened to the show here. So clear your head, clear your head. I know you've probably been thinking about it already, but... You know, I want that first memory of you working on a computer, that first memory where you were like, uh, I don't know, enamored by it, fascinated by it. Like, like what's that first thought? So I, I, I grew up on a farm and, and in Switzerland and even in Canada when I when we first got to Canada, we didn't have computers. And then in uh, school, they had uh, Commodore Pets on the side of the classroom. And the, the first year I was there. Basically, in Switzerland, you do uh, school, like grade school, whatever, in nine years as opposed to 12, which was what we had in Canada. So the the uh, schooling moves a bit quicker. Um, you're in school for longer in terms of per day, right? So as, as a person in grade one, you might only be in school from, you know, 10 until 1 p.m. or 2 p.m. or something like that. But by the time you're in grade five, you're there from eight until five or six, um, half a day on Saturday, stuff like that. Why am I just hearing about this now? So so you, you move more quickly. So when I moved, I moved from basically at the end of grade four in, in that summer, we moved to Canada and I was moving into grade five. And in a lot of the technical subjects, I was somewhat ahead just because of the way that the, the teaching went. Um, I had plenty to learn. I had English to learn and all sorts of social studies and other things like that. It's just that some of the technical subjects, I was a bit ahead. So for math, for example, is where these particular computers were in the same uh, classroom that I had in a math class. And when I was done my you know 30 questions of algebra or whatever they were teaching at that point, that just you know, point at the computers and ask the teacher if I could go entertain myself. And uh, yeah, that's that's where I started. Um, first year, just playing games. So, you know, sort of text graphic type games. Uh, Minor 49er, I think, was one of my favorites there. And then, uh, if I remember right, the year after the school got a bunch of Commodore 64s. And I think I got a hold of like a basic textbooky thing or something. I, w- I was a voracious reader when I was young, so I, I would read anything I could get my hands on. I had piles of books throughout my sleeping, like bedroom, throughout, even at school. Fiction, not, not fiction? Did, did you, um, was there one? Really anything I could get my hands on. So I pretty much read 
every book in that small, tiny little school's library. By grade nine, I distinctly remember flipping through a dictionary. Just, I was bored. So I was flipping through a dictionary and somebody had run into the uh, school and saw me standing there flipping through a dictionary just like I was reading it and basically ran back outside and yelled, he's now reading a dictionary. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Do you like have... the encyclopedias were done, you know, all everything I could get my hands on. <laughs> so, Do you have one of these um, like abilities to retain, like a memory-wise? I forgot what the word is, but like a photographic memory on any level that you're reading? Not Something really. like that? I no? Do, I think they remember concepts better than huge specifics. My brother is somebody who, who I tend to learn very quickly, at least in my <laughs> younger years I did. Um, so most things came very easy to me. Like school was not, it was never a challenge for me. The challenge was staying engaged as opposed to the content itself. Um, my brother is somebody who learned a bit slower, but he would, he would learn things that he would know it, that there was... You know, I'd be like, yeah, I think it might be this way. I'd be like, nope, it's that way. And when he, when he said it, you know, it's that way, he was sure. Um, for me, it was just easy as opposed to really thorough. And then the thorough stuff came later when I really, you know, dug into computers and that sort of side. I mean, I, I, I remember this one time you know, talking about learning computers early on. Um, I was... I'm going to jump ahead. I apologize. One tiny. Okay. I'll, I'll pull you back, but go. My first language. So my first language was basic. I remember trying to get this thing working as a for loop of some sort. And I thought I would need to speak computer to this thing, right? It was four, I equals one. And then, you know, two, whatever. But instead of writing out two, I used an arrow. Right. I mean, I'm speaking computer to a thing. Why not just use computer things? Right. And it just wouldn't work. Syntax error, syntax error, or whatever. And I was getting frustrated. And my, my, uh, my brother did a drive by and he, he doesn't do computers at all. Never did, never cared for them, whatever. And basically at some point he's just asking me what's going on. Like, why are you so frustrated? I'm saying I'm, I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing, trying to tell it what to do. And it wouldn't, it is not doing its thing. And he, he just, you know, looked at it and says, why don't you just say two right there? <laughs> oh, I got, did that get you, did that get you more frustrated? <laughs> it got me mad. <laughs> <laughs> it got me so yeah. mad at myself. <laughs> There's I no think you experienced you, you experienced that stuck in the box moment there, right? You're stuck in the box, can't see outside of it. But yeah, that was my sort of first uh, recollection of how things started with computers. Uh, were there other things that you were interested in now when you're, you know, I like talking about the 14, 15, 16, 17, when, when you're the, sort of that old, because you're really now, well, at least in the U.S., you now have to start taking school seriously if there is something that you want to pursue. Um, and that's kind of like a, a strong set of formative years. So, so talk about those years, like right before you say are eligible for university, what other things are you doing? I was on the farm with my folks. Uh, we had a milk farm, you know, other than school and work, which was farm work. Um, milking cows, you know, harvesting in the summer and, you know, feeding cattle in the winter. I never, I went to school in upstate New York. Okay. I, I was from Long Island. I was from like New York City, right? Okay. Well, the island. I go to school in upstate New York because I want to get as far away from home as possible. Not because of anything bad. Just, I just wanted to be on my own. So I met some friends who had farms in upstate New York, my friend Missy. And I go to her house one time and um, there's a cow in the barn. I mean, it's cold up there. Dude, I had never realized how big these animals were. <laughs> like you see them from a road and whatever, but you get up close. I mean, I was scared, dude. I was like scared. I couldn't believe how massive they were. I, we, had a few, we had a few bulls that were 
you get used to that, right? You're, you're around, you know, whether it's horses, or or whatever, you get used to a certain size animal. We had a few bulls that two that I can remember that were massive. Like even the me is like, you know, this is twice the size of a normal cow. Like, <laughs> but yeah. So, I mean, the other things I like this is uh, I like taking things apart. So anything that I could figure out how it worked. So on the computer front that, that was, you know, at some point I bought my own uh, Commodore 128 and learn you know a lot of things in terms of assembly language and all sorts of stuff but non techy stuff i would say i had a motorcycle uh i was 11 or 12 years old i think i was 11 when 11 or 12 years old uh when my when my uh, dad came home with two dirt bikes for basically yeah. you know the kids and whoever to to use so i learned how to ride when i was young and then as as things go if they break you know your parents they told you well figure out how to fix it right if you tell me what part you need i'll try and figure out where to get it you know whether i buy it or source another you know sacrificial non-working bike or something like that and then you know you learned how to wrench and use a screwdriver and a pry bar and you know, as part of sometimes as part of work other times as I want to ride this bike and it's not moving forward. So I learned how to take an engine apart, put it back together. Um, you must've had farm equipment too. I had, did you have back in the day? Did you have my friend Missy actually started a dairy farm a couple of years ago. Okay. So she's got all that new milking equipment, right? I mean, the, the cows just sit in the barn, I guess, and it's all hooked up. You must've had that too in the, in the nineties. We had, we had some milking equipment. Um, it was all manual in terms of like cleaning and, and hooking it up to each cow and getting the cows in and out and all that sort of stuff. So it was as minimal in terms of automation as like today you'd look at that and say, wow, like you could do, you know, one or two cows at a time. Um, we, when we started, I think we had, I want to say mid teens in terms of number of milking cows. Um, many years later, when we sold that farm, we were doing 40, 50 cows twice a day. The big thing really is that that work is constant. Like there is no, oh, I'm going to go take a vacation or I'm going to, you know, sleep in. Like Toby, you want to, you're going to laugh at me now. And I'm, I'm just going to say this because of my ignorance growing up in the city. Okay. I never realized that in order for the cows to be producing as much milk as they were producing that at some point they had to be pregnant. Like I, I always had it in my head that uh, cows produce milk. Like that's what they do. And I think one of my friends upstate started laughing at me. Like it was no, no business. <laughs> it's like, Bill, what are you talking about? They have to get pregnant. <laughs> you know, it's a different experience, right? I mean, I, I grew up with, with a lot of animals, you know, and over the years, anything from, you know, cats and dogs to rabbits um i don't think we ever had chickens so i don't think we any, ever had any bird-like things other than the maybe a budgie or something in the house um to you know cows and so when it's time to sort of graduate it doesn't sound like you're into the farming like you could have taken over the farm i guess right so like where's your head at that point i i knew i did not really belong on the farm simply because Every summer when we we're harvesting and, and doing silage and hay, um, I had really bad hay fever, like to the point where my eyes were almost swollen shut at times. I And you still had to be out there doing that work? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's not, not, um, that was not an excuse. Oh, that's miserable, man. And the, the, the interesting part or the maybe not so interesting part is most of the uh, allergy medication that I could take would knock me out. And being drowsy or shall we say even asleep next to most of that type of equipment that you would run was not a, <laughs> you, you learn quickly not to, uh, you can lose a finger. Yeah. Very quickly. So, so yeah, no, I, I knew that I was not really, um, somebody to take on the family farm. One of my brothers, uh, might've been, but he, he decided ultimately not to as well. So. The family farm was sold. I don't even remember when exactly, but at some point later. At some point, you and your brother didn't want it. So I have, I have two brothers and three sisters. Um, none of 
none of the family really. Nobody wanted it. Yeah. That's really interesting that at, two, so there's like six of you. And even if somebody married somebody that was into farming because of where you lived, nobody wanted it. Yeah, it wasn't that we didn't want it. It was wrong timing for some of us, right? My my brother might have been okay with it. It was just uh, my dad, my stepdad passed away. Um, I think it was 96, if I remember right. And nobody really was ready for it yet. You know, you had to still go out and maybe finish college or, or university or whatever. And, you know, sow your oats, get some experience doing what it is you wanted to do and not settle down into a literally 12, 16 hour day, seven days a week or something, right? Um, managing a, a business that, you know, actually did take managing, right? It wasn't just mindless do all these things. It's figuring out when do you harvest things? Where do you put the cattle? Where do you... Isn't that what the farmer's almanac is for, Toby? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I was teasing my 16-year-old two months ago because at the new year the farmer's almanac comes out and my dad would always have one in the house right and then and i'd always be like dad we're not farmers what are we doing it's like no bill you gotta have a farmer's almanac Every, <laughs> everything's in there so i did the same thing to the 16 year old like um last month i came home with the farmer's almanac and i gave it to her she's like we're not farmers i said oh no 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 read it Eric. everything you need in life is in this book <laughs> So, Farmer's Almanac, uh, Reader's Digest, and there's another thing that just slipped my mind. What's your choice at this point now? Is university like the only thing in your head? That's what you're going to do? Um, it's sort of the default choice. The, the things in my head are not. I grew up with a tiny bit of privilege in the sense that milk farming can be lucrative if, if done at scale, but for us, it was a very good income for the area we were, we, we were living in, and it was steady income, right? It wasn't like, oh, I'm I'm going to harvest grain and I get you know paychecks a year, or I I have you know beef cattle and whenever I sell some of those for slaughter meat whatever, I I get some money. No, I we got a check every month if I remember right for for all the milk that we basically shipped every two days, right? The tanker came by and picked up the milk every two days. As long as you kept the cows alive, you were good. It wasn't like, how's the crop going to be this year? Yeah, pretty In much. General right? sense. So there, there was a steady source of income and, and my dad, my stepdad knew, knew how to manage that well enough, it, it seemed. Um, so I pulled a, a allowance, a fairly substantial one uh, compared to other kids in that area. Um, from basically day one and there wasn't a whole lot to spend it on other than maybe a car or something like that. So you got paid to do what I would call chores on the farm. They, they gave you, you got paid essentially. Oh, so I, I got up at, you know, 4.35 AM every morning to go work essentially. And then the bus, you know, school bus came by 8.30 ish, give or take, took us to school and then, you know, by 5 p.m. we're home, but then 5 p.m. we would have our big meal since, I don't know, like grabbing a lunchbox and having a big meal at school in the middle of the day, just whatever, it didn't really work. So mom would cook something. So lunch or, you know, the big meal, whatever, would come 5 p.m. when everybody got home from school. And then by 6 p.m. we were back out there, you know, milking or feeding or... And then what, you did homework at 9 o'clock? I funny didn't I didn't have homework. So that was the other thing. I I went through school. I never studied really. I never really had homework. I got it done in school, you know, either during recess if there was something or in the class where it was handed out because homework was handed out about halfway through the class and that was usually enough time for me to finish it. That's just I wish it was like that today. And I know that these kids could probably get some homework done. But from the five that I had in my, with my first marriage, and they're all out of school now, with the two that I have now, it's every day they come home. I'm like, so how much homework do you have today? And then they rattle off to me what they have. And I guesstimate that you got like three hours of homework tonight. My brain just says, oh. I don't, I don't know if that is because teaching or, you know, has changed. I do know that, that most of my uh, colleagues, like people I went to school with, 
uh, my friends, they had homework, like they would go, get home and say, Oh, I got to write an essay or whatever. And I'd be like, well, I don't know, I had an open period. So, you know, I put something together. I got her done. That's, that's brilliant. The, the big thing is also that I did not particularly try very hard, right? The, there were subjects that I really cared about that I really was interested in. So math and certain science subjects, but then, you know, others like history or social studies and other things like that. At that point in my life, I had I had really no interest in it. And I, I would basically just regurgitate whatever it was that I remembered. And, you know, I, I'd skate by. You did the bare minimum. Yeah, 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 yeah. For those subjects. Um, and I remember my mom, she, she was so frustrated with me. At one point, she's like, Toby, if you just try a tiny bit, you'd get your 85s and 90s. I'm like, yeah, but I just don't care. Right? It, it did not interest me. That part of life, in some sense, did not interest me at the point. Nowadays, it, I feel that I've missed out a bit because you're like, you know, it would be nice to know a bit more history or have a bit more context, social context and other things like that. So you're not, so I, I don't want to go too far here, but you're not the avid reader that you were back um, in your teenage years? Uh, today, less so. Just, you know, you're tired at the end of your workday, your eyes are done. Um, and... I enjoy being on a computer. I enjoy creative endeavors. And so to create something to read and, and, you know, build something. But most of my work takes, or I should say my work right now takes most of that energy and makes it hard to continue with that. So instead I go out and I enjoy a nice meal. I enjoy a, a walk, um, you know, a drive where I don't have to engage, shall we say, the, the higher reasoning centers of my brain quite so so hard and instead can enjoy just uh, being in the moment and, and doing things like that. You know, that's fair because people laugh at me sometimes, but I, our day jobs sometimes are so intense that I need my brain to shut down. And I I like watching an hour or two of just dumb TV. Just dumb sitcom. The dumber, the kids will look at me like, you like the dumbest things. And I'm like, yeah, because I don't want to think. I just want to sort of laugh. I don't want serious. I don't like the crime dramas. I got enough drama during the day. I just like right now we're watching um, Big Bang Theory. Like, oh, and yeah. it's perfect, right? You get to use your brain a tiny bit. But I just, I need movies and anything that just allows my brain to shut down. There's, there's definitely quite a bit of that, um, you know, the doom scrolling on, on what's sort of left of Twitter. Um, and then, you know, some social media things, whatever. And then, yeah, YouTube and, you know, whatever other means of Netflix or whatever you consume. I'm scared on the, on the Twitter app. I only go, I only look at my followers feed. Because I've realized how easy it is to get sucked into content that I didn't ask for. And um, warning signs go off in my head when I'm like, why are you looking at this video? I know it's interesting, but this is not the content you want to be consuming, Bill. And I'm like, oh, that's why it's there. I'm on the wrong, I'm on the wrong side of this feed. On the wrong tab uh, nowadays. Yeah, it's scary to me. Like, I don't, that's not where I want to decompress anyway all right but i gotta get you back i gotta get you back to so you're gonna go to university that's the only option um, and i felt the same way i was a c student in high school i did not enjoy school i did the bare minimum to and everything but now it's like every all your peers are going to college you have to go to college almost whether you like it or not and I for sure wasn't ready for it. But so what are the choices? What are you doing for, for university? So, yeah, basically uh, my, my thought process and I, I, I have this little dialogue inside my head sometimes. It was basically, well, I, I guess I should go to university because that's sort of, you know, roughly what you do if, unless you're going to work. Right. And because of the work I've done previously, I'd saved up a lot of money so I could actually afford to basically pay for my university outright. My parents paid for my room and board. I was at, uh, in, in, in room, I was in a university, uh, 
dormitory or whatever for the first time for the first year. What school was it? How far away was it from the farm? It was uh, roughly a one and a half, two hour drive away. And uh, it was called Brandon University. So it, literally, if you think of, you know, North America, you got the West Coast, the East Coast, it's, it's literally in the middle. So yeah, uh, tiny little university. Um, they had two PhD programs, one in music, one in education. Why did you choose that school? It was the closest one. The closest school for what? What did you want to study? Or at that point, you didn't know. Um, I knew that I liked computers, and that was pretty much what I was, you know, starting in. I, I didn't really think about any any other sort of options. So, computer science, math is what I started with. Um, as a matter of fact, from all the work I've done on the computer up until this point, so I, you know, been programming for seven-ish years at this point. Um, I had, you know, taught computer courses to farmers a couple of years and helped out also at the school board installing some machines and, you know, copying some disks and stuff like that, aside from, from the farm work. What programming were you doing, though? Was it basic, Pascal at the time, C? Uh, <laughs> there's a story there. So I started with basic and then moved to assembly pretty quickly and then that was all on the commodore so 6502 assembly so on and then in high school they didn't have commodore computers anymore they had apple 2 and uh pcs and the apple 2 stuff is 6502 as well but i was like yeah i've, I've got that cpu sort of pat down so i was less interested in that started working on working exploring playing with whatever um on the PCs, so new processor and new system architecture and so on. And I started in on that pretty much with, you know, assembly um, and was doing that for quite some time. And to make a longer story short, uh, at some point I ran into a sort of an issue I couldn't solve. Again, my mind is going through, well, I, I need help. Um, who, who do I ask for help? Because the local, like, teachers or whatever they 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 didn't know what i was doing um so who has people that know what i'm doing so well university people must know right there must be a professor at university that understands this so basically where's the nearest university with like computer people in it and you know you look through the yellow pages white pages whatever try and find you know and you find oh it's brand new university okay fine so you know you save up your pennies and pay phone and you like call Brandon University and get the switchboard to put you through to the computing science department and you 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 reach uh, the the secretary for the department and you know I'm I'm maybe 15 years old at the time and had no concept of like yeah of course these people know what the hell that I'm talking about right and I basically unloaded I unloaded on the on this lady and basically she's like I think you need to talk to Duick. And literally, he was—he would be the only person in this area, uh, likely in a substantial uh, part of, of that part of the world at that time, that would understand sort of the pieces that I'm working with. And basically, him and I talked for the better part of an hour. And at the end, he's like, okay, I can't help you anymore because I need to see what you're doing. Like, I need to see the code, whatever. And it's not like today. You say, oh, here, like, we're chatting through the space or pull up a browser or whatever. Like, that. this, you know, you you transferred things physically with floppy disk, right? Um, not even a USB stick. And, um, you know, it's like, next time you're in town, like, come by and we'll, we'll have a look. And uh, I'm like, well, I'm in town. You know, my, my family's going in the brand and at some point in the next week here, is it okay if I come by? It's like, yeah, sure, you know, by all means. And I did go by with them and we ended up trying to debug my, my you know, brought my floppy disk and we ended up trying to debug this thing for the better part of an afternoon. Like, I, I think I walked into his office about 1 p.m. And I know that around 4 or 5 p.m. he basically told me, okay, I need to go home because my wife... <laughs> uh, he, he was also a professor at the university. I got to know them very well later on. Um, you know, uh, was making supper and, and you know, you, you go home. If somebody makes something for you, you show up type of thing. 
And then he basically looked at me and says, yeah, so just so you know, A, you're nuts. And B, and he reached up and he grabbed Turbo C, uh, Borland Turbo C off the shelf, which came in this sort of like box with the manuals plus yeah, the discs to it. Oh, basically grabbed that, handed it to me and said, here, use this. And I'm like, what is it? And he says, oh, you'll like it. And I'm like, okay, sure, whatever. And, you know, thank you and left. And then uh, installed that on. So we, we had uh, 40 meg hard drives in the PCs at school. And DOS at the time could have partitions of 32 megs. So there was this eight megs unused that nobody there knew that was there and whatever. So I formatted that and had my own little eight meg hard disk. And then, you know, installed that and started using it. And then I ran into a roadblock sometime later. I really liked C at the time because it was a higher level thing. I didn't have to, you know, try and remember where all the registers and all the values were and all these other things. Um, and uh, ran into the concept of a pointer never really occurred to me because in assembly, that, that, that's just what you use so and and see there was this weird star thing you know the asterisk it's like what the what is that like i don't understand what it is a concept just didn't make sense so you know a month or two later i basically called up do it again i said hey what is a star thing like thank you for the thing you gave me it's awesome but like what is a star thing <laughs> and we're on the phone and about 15 minutes in he he understands what I'm trying to get through to him. He's like, oh, that's a pointer. I'm like, what the hell is a pointer? <laughs> like, <laughs> this is frustrating as all hell. I understand everything else about the language, but what the hell is this pointer thing? <laughs> and he tried, like, he tries to explain it to me. In the end, he's like, okay, just do, like, he, he sort of remembered roughly what the, the, the menu things were. And he says, just look for this menu item, and then you can see your code plus what it assembles to. So, so the assembly language before it gets assembled into, into, you know, object code, and you can look side by side what it gets translated to, because you understand this side. <laughs> and then I'm like, okay, thanks. Click I'm up on them and, and did that. And that's how I learned about pointers. <laughs> so. <laughs> See, the fact that somebody over there, faculty even took the time to, to meet with you and talk to you. I don't know if that would happen today. The, in retrospect, that was the best part about my university experience is that I went to such a small school because the teachers were very accessible. And, and I don't remember a teacher that didn't give me their time, whether that was, you know, me being oblivious and insistent or whatever, but Dude, you're not even a student there. You're just some teenager. At that point, no. But even later on as a student, there's many a story that I can say where, you know, you had access to your to your teachers. My, my graduating class, if I remember right, was right around 10 people for my, like for computing science. My biggest class in computing science was, well, I didn't go to my first year computing science. I got advanced placement in the second year, but... The, the first year computing science uh, courses, 30, maybe 40 students, but a good chunk of those were not computing science students. They were also service courses for the rest of the university. Yeah, you had, I, I had a similar thing in SUNY Potsdam. It was a small community of people that were taking computer science at the time. So uh, you, you knew everybody and uh, there's no way to avoid the people you didn't like. <laughs> you tried to hang out with the people you did like, but um, yeah, it's the same thing. <laughs> I, think we, I think we pretty much all got along. Um, I mean, I was told off by a couple of people, a couple of students, my 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 friends later, that my behavior was unacceptable, or you know that I needed to pay attention or whatever. And again, uh, in terms of social skills at that point in my life. They weren't particularly the best, right? I, I was more interested in the technology than, than most of the social aspects. I had my friends and, you know, we'd go out and, you know, go to a bar, or go dancing or something once in a while. But it was as likely for me to be sitting in a corner reading something as it was for me to be 
you know, interacting with my friends, so to say. So, so let me, let me pull you back in here a little bit. You, you do a four year degree there. I assume you, you get your degree. I got a double, uh, so I got a bachelor's. So I got a major, double major, major in computing science and math, but there, so that, that was not a full four years. If I remember right, I graduated in 96 having had advanced placement, so skipping a year and then taking five years. In there, I actually quit university for a couple of years, tore my last exam in half, handed it to the professor and walked out. You're just frustrated? You're fed up with, like, what did you do then after that? Uh, so the exam was, was one for uh, data structures and algorithms, which was a two-term course so from September till was it May or March or whatever. Okay, so like a fall and a spring sort of. Yeah, yeah, it's like a full two-term course. Um, and the uh, instruction was very methodical. And I hadn't learned that you don't have to go to every class if you don't want to. I, I was still in high school mode where you showed up in every class. And, and the instruction was three times a week. First day of the week was like introduction to new concept. Second day was, you know, introduction of advanced or optimized version of this thing. And, and Friday was review, right? Well, by halfway through class on Monday, you know, I, I pretty much knew what the rest was, if there was going to be anything, there wasn't really anything new to learn. Um, but instead of just going away and doing something else, I, I would show up and I was getting, shall we say bored. The exam was 13 pages long word for word, number for number, the same as any question I'd had throughout the previous eight months. And I wrote three pages and then just, I was like, you know, just, you feel like it's rising in your throat. Yeah. Like, okay. I'm done. Yeah. The anxiety and, and not even anxiety. It was just disgust in some sense, like, come on, give me some amount of challenge at least. And in the end, I just tore it apart. And the professor asked me, like, is there a problem? And I'm like, not anymore. And I left. And then I I moved to Switzerland um, for, I ended up being there almost two years. You did ran odd jobs money. over there? Yeah, I was going to say. Well, I ran out of money. And then, <laughs> again, my, my brain goes through this little exercise of like, well, you have no money. So I guess you got to get money. Well, how do you get money? You have a job. What am I good at? Well, I'm pretty decent with computers. So who has computers? Well, universities have computers. Okay, so where's the nearest university? <laughs> and <laughs> that was uh, ETH. So the Swiss National University in Zurich was about an hour away by train. And uh, basically, you know, took the train, walked in, you know, asked for the nearest office that managed computers or whatever. Uh, walked into basically the computing science sysadmin's office <laughs> and asked the person I ran into who would turn out to be me, be my boss later, uh, basically asked them, hey, uh, you guys need some help. <laughs> and he's like, well, we can, we always have work, right? We always have too much. Um, you know, what, what have you done? And we had a 15 minute interview and then my future colleague also came into the room and we had another maybe 15 minute interview or so. And then he's basically, okay, so, uh, when do you want to start? And I'm like, well, I got no money. So Monday's good. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you just make that call or you just walk in. You don't even think about what you're doing really. And you get to talk to somebody and they talk to you and then you make these things happen. Like it's mind blowing to me. When I was growing up, I was actually very shy and, and, when I first, my first year at university, I decided that I was going to work on that part of me. I, I did not like this shyness. So in high school, for example, if I had to go up on a stage and do something like perform something, read something, whatever, it didn't really matter. But in front of a whole bunch of people, even if it was a, a larger classroom, and here we're talking 15 people, like not huge by any, by any stretch, I would be beat red in the face. I'd, I'd forget what I was going to say. My ears would be ringing. I'd be stuttering. And, and all of that feeds in on itself and it, it just gets worse. Um, and I was really shy about performing, 
in, in front of an audience, how, however big that audience was. Um, in university, that is something I worked on in part because, well, none of these people know me. Um, none of my friends or, or I didn't have that many friends in high school, but uh, none, of, none of the people I went to high school with really were at, at this university, even though it was the closest one. And none of them were in my classes. So these are all new people. If I screwed up, I wouldn't see them again. So whatever. And, and that's sort of how I phrase it to myself. And I pushed myself to try and present something, to try and be as part of a group when it was a group project to, you know, take the lead side of it and speak up. And when I saw something I didn't understand, I put my hand up in class and ask questions. Even that would be really tough for me before. And that has carried over in my life. So I really enjoy teaching at this point. I, I love being in front of a class and helping students, mentoring. Um, but that was not the case. I, I did not like that environment. I didn't even know that I would enjoy that type of activity because the environment to do that activity, I did not enjoy being in. But you knew enough that it was something that you had to work on. It was going to be an important skill set. Um, I didn't even identify it as an important skill set. It's just I did not like the fact that felt this way in, in these type of situations. And, and it wasn't that I wanted to hone that as a skill to be better at presenting something, some topic, or even have a conversation with somebody that I thought was, you know, uh, an idol or, or some, you know, somebody above me in terms of skill or knowledge or whatever, um, some, an authority, that sort of thing. Um, it was more one of, I don't like feeling this way. I want to be able to just be normal in this situation. And that's what I, that's what, that was a driving factor in some sense. And it, it, it has paid benefits to, to be blunt. So now you have your first full-time job in industry, essentially. <laughs> My first full-time job, other than the farming side and the, the side gigs I did here and there, um, was actually working at the university. So the, one of the operators, so they had these big raised floor uh, data centers or whatever with, you know, micro boxes in it and other mainframey type things. Um, so the operator in that space um, threw out his back and he couldn't lift the paper, uh, change the paper for the printers anymore for printing reports and transcripts and stuff like that. And uh, basically, they were looking for somebody to run their reports early in the morning. And I started hanging out with the tech people at the university by this point. And basically, I think his name was Daryl, but the, the lead, the head honcho for the, the, what do you call it, the IT department, I guess, was, you know, said, yeah, you know, Jerry's going to be out. And he's gone for six months or something. Um, you know, we're, we're and nobody wants to wake up. So who wants to wake up in the, and Toby's like, I have no problem. I'm awake already. <laughs> my, my, my schedule at that point had, had significantly, uh, changed, but yeah. So that was my first job. And then during the time when I was away from university, I worked as a sysadmin at the ETH in Zurich. Did you finish you? Cause you said you finished your degree. Did you finish that in, in Switzerland or you ended up going back and finishing in Brandon? No, I came back. I came back. I uh, rewrote the exam that I tore in half. They kindly let me rewrite that, the exact same exam, um, and, uh, several years later. Um, really? Yeah. Several years later, you got to take the same exam? Yep. Did you, did you have to even study? <laughs> uh, I didn't. I passed it, uh, not flying colors, but I passed it. So the thing is, I came back from Switzerland um, in November of whatever year that was. And I, I apologize. I do not remember what the year was. Um, and basically, 206, which was that two-term course, had already started back in September, right? And I wanted to, at, at the very least, join that class but preferably, I would. I didn't want to redo the whole class, but it was a prerequisite for pretty much anything else. So, so I need to figure out how to how to 
get through this class preferably quickly. Uh, if I could rewrite the exam and pass it, that would be great. But if not, then I wanted to join the class that was already in progress, right? And the university allowed you to challenge exams. So if you thought that you could pass an exam, you know, you could go and challenge the exam. You had to pay the fee. And if you didn't pass the exam, you got, you know, got docked on your GPA and you were out the money, but you got to retake the class if you wanted to. And I didn't want to challenge it. There was actually a rule that if you had taken the class, you can't challenge it. Some weird thing. Um, I just wanted to have this thing over with. And I found a, a section in the calendar. So the, the university calendar is like this big phone book like thing that doesn't exist today anymore. And I'm looking through the rules and trying to figure out, you know, is there some way? And then I found out that if you're, they had a rule where if your exam result, final exam result was not at least representative of the work you'd done before. So if all through the course you got A's and then your final exam was like a C, you had an option to rewrite the exam because they were trying to figure out like, what if you have an exam anxiety or you don't do well in exam, or had a bad day, whatever. You at least had an opportunity. You had a bad day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, several years ago, right? And <laughs> there was a time limit to how much you could, how, how far afterwards you could do this. And I basically argued that I had not been in the country for the amount of that time limit. On a Hail Mary, decided, oh, I'll try it. The worst they'll say is no. And they basically referred it back to the Dean of Science, who had, you know, we'd gotten to know each other as a student. And basically, he pulled me into his office and, you know, he's like, Toby, you better bloody well pass that exam. <laughs> <laughs> and the professor uh, that had to give me the exam, he was still the same professor. Um, he wasn't too happy about it. And I had to make a side deal with him that he would give me the exam. And that was, I had to do a book report on a book of his choosing. And uh, I'm like, okay, sure. I'm like, I mean, you know, as long as we're not talking huge, you know. Yeah, thesis level. Uh... <laughs> yeah, you know, something reasonable, sure, whatever. Like, let, let me move forward. And the book he assigned me was uh, Carnegie Mellon's uh, How, to Influence, How to Win Friends and Influence People, which was, was a very interesting book for me to read in that frame of mind. So any, anyways, I, I passed that exam, which meant that 206, which was that two-term course, data structures and algorithms, I, I had now behind me. But the next big course was, uh, I think it was called systems programming at the time. It was basically, you know, how, how do you program a Unix system, uh, sort of like C programming systems type stuff. And uh, it was operating systems as well in there with that whole thing. That was also a two-term course. These are the two main courses at the at the time in the university for computing science that if you're going to get a major in computing science, you have to, like everything else was based around them. A lot of the things were, these things were prerequisites and stuff like that. So 306 had also started and was taught by Duick, who I'd mentioned earlier, the person who'd given me a lot of time and stuff. And basically, I wanted to see if I could catch up, right? As opposed to wait till the next September and then go through it. I wanted to catch up and just be in with the course. And so I went into Duick's office and, you know, asked him how, what could I do to join the class? And he's like, well, we just finished writing the midterm. So, like, it's going to be tough. What have you done? And I talked about the work I did at ETH and my sysadmin work and, I'd worked some uh, side projects, um, OpenBSD, so systems programming, stuff like that. And then uh, basically goes, okay, sounds like you've at least got somewhat similar experience. Here's, you know, the assignments, go away and bring them back when you're done. And I went away for a few days and furiously, you know, did assignments, gave them back. And he's like, okay, you know, sit down and I'll, I'll mark these. And he literally marked them like with me right there. 
And at the end, he's like, uh, hang on a second. And he's like looking through papers. He pulls out a piece of paper and he says, here's the midterm, sit, write. And I, I literally wrote the midterm in front of him in his office. And you know, a couple hours later, he starts marking it and he goes, okay, I guess I got to figure out how to get you into my class. And he picks up, he picks up the phone and he calls the register's office and he's like, Hey, Jackie, it's Duick from Computing Science. Um, I, I completely forgot. I've got this student. I should have registered him, you know, uh, at the start of September. I'm really sorry about this. Is there any way that, like, we can get him registered as a student, whatever? And I, I didn't hear the other side of the conversation. I assume it was, yeah, we can figure it out or something because up next he's like, you're awesome. You know, Barb and I will have, her, have you over for dinner sometime. You know, thank you very much. And he puts the phone down and says, okay, get your ass down to the register's office. And, you know, talk to this person. So all of my university. It's all about relationships. It's all about relationships. You had, you had great relationships at that point. And you proved yourself. In those moments, right? That's wild, man. Cocky enough or, or ignorant enough person to somehow make it work. I, I always came in a side door, but somehow came out the front. I don't know. <laughs> Ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is bliss. I, I don't, yes. Yeah. I, I find it interesting that, you know, I try to tell my kids all the time, you, if you don't ask, you can't receive. If you do not ask, you can't receive. And in one form or another, you're constantly asking. You're being presented a challenge you don't hesitate you do it and you, you that now you back that person in the in the corner right because they don't expect you to come back they don't expect you to do this they don't expect you and now they're like shit now now i gotta now i gotta do my part <laughs> that turned into in terms of work i worked at that university after i graduated i kept working at the university um was a you know sort of summer job that turned into part-time during the years when I was studying, like the, during the fall and winter semesters. But then basically summer, it would go back to being full-time working for the IT side of things. I did a bunch of programming for the library and other things. I did a printer accounting system um, for them. So for students that that was running many years after I left, I came back many years later at one point and I'm like, holy crap, this is still I am terrified because I know how bad that code was. Now that I look back at it, right? Nobody's had to maintain it. It just works. So you're okay. Oh, they, they maintained it and improved it, I am sure. But it was just terrifying seeing that still running. And then about a year after my graduation, sometime after my graduation, I don't think it was maybe less than a year, um, Dr. Dewitt came up to me and he basically is like, hey, um, you need to go get an, another job. Like, go elsewhere right uh you're, you're getting too comfortable here and, and my response was literally no no i'm good like i'm making money i know what i'm doing i'm having fun i'm comfortable here and he's like no you need to get out <laughs> right and then uh the next time uh my job came around for renewal for whatever reason um it didn't get renewed uh the position the position didn't didn't exist anymore. <laughs> and, uh, he he uh, opened doors for me, and he also shut them when it was appropriate. I guess the best way to put it. What an amazing mentor you had there for a long time. Yeah, it was it was awesome. Uh, he's still a decent friend. Um, he has retired in the meantime. So, what was the next job? The next job was Wolfram Research. So, um, I friend of mine, if I remember right, was working at Wolfram Research as a Windows programmer. And uh, basically, I had enough experience under my belt at this point with different types of um, Unix operating systems and Unix systems. So I got hired by Wolfram Research as like a porting engineer of some sort where I would port Mathematica to different Unix systems. So, you know, IRIX and OSF and SunOS and Solaris and all these other things. That, and the IBMs and the HPs and those mini... The things that don't exist today anymore, right? And, 
And I distinctly remember I had 13 platforms, a range of 32 and 64 bit stuff like Deco, Deco S, uh, Alpha 64 bit CPUs, stuff like that. Um, where my job was to basically make sure that Mathematica compiled, um, that the tests would largely pass. And if they didn't, then, you know, if it passed on this thing, but not that thing, let's track down why and, you know, figure out, you know, hey, this code that you guys wrote is not portable. And, you know. Dude, that is not easy work, man. That is like, that. I would not have enjoyed that. I, I, I love brew so much because I hate having to say make configure and then make build and watch it all break. And I get, ah, right. Like, but that was your world, man. That was my world. And Mathematica at the time was written in a locally developed version of what they called objective C, but it was not the objective C from Apple. It was their own, uh, preprocessor on top of C compilers, um, which gave you the illusion, for lack of a better phrase, of having some form of object uh, oriented or object encapsulation for some object, for, for some structures. Um, it was, in, in hindsight, it was a horrible thing, but, you know, at the time, hey, this is, this is what we used, right? Um, I was there for couple of years on a, so th this was in the U S so I got a temporary visa, a TN visa and worked there for a couple of years, two and a half years, maybe. And then, uh, moved to Edmonton back to Canada where I basically had three things line up. Um, one is I got into grad school in university of Alberta, which is in Edmonton. And I got a sysadmin job at the university. So, you know, school, job. And my girlfriend at the time was also in Edmonton. She'd moved to Edmonton and, and was uh, working through her master's and PhD at the university. So I'm like, hey, three out of three ain't bad. So I'm moving. And I packed up a U-Haul and tiny little uh, Ford Ranger truck and hauled it all up to Edmonton. Um, I liked Edmonton. I liked where the university was. I and somebody showed me that hidden pool, that inside hidden pool. But I found that town to be um, really nice. It felt like a university town, and um, even the down, well, the downtown too. I think was okay. But it's a blue collar town, a service industry to the the oil and gas sector. Plus, is the capital of of the province, so the state, if you wish. So it had it had the government side of things. The money was really in Calgary, where a lot of the headquarters or remote offices were for for the oil and gas. But the the blue collar, if you wish, and and sort of like nitty gritty type stuff was in Edmonton. I didn't like it when I first got there, but it's a it's a town or a city that grows on you. Funny enough, even though like you know the the saying is eight months of winter and four months of construction, and and that's. That that's literally what this place is like, right? Um, I, was, I was there 14, 13, 14 years, I think. But you didn't, you weren't doing your university stint for a decade, so. I took my time doing my master's. I think it took me five, maybe even seven years. Uh, I'm going to go with five. But the, the thing is, as a university employee, they would pay for the tuition part of the expenses. So all I had was ancillary fees. And since I was working full time, I took my time. I did my master's part time, um, finished it. And then uh, my PhD, I didn't start for several years. And then uh, was introduced to a professor that was looking for students and we sort of hit it off. And my requirement was, well, I don't want you to pay me because I don't want to mark things. I don't want to mark tests for you or TA for you or whatever. I have a job. It pays me significantly better than anything an RA ship or a TA ship. So research assistant or teaching assistant would, would ever pay. And I obviously work full time. So I, you know, I, I can't just spend a whole bunch of time on, on 
anything beyond just myself. He was willing to let me do it part time and uh, basically got to the point where eventually I left the university, my job at the university, um, and moved down to the States to work for Twitter. So slow down for one second. Slow down for one second. So you spend about, you say, like a little over a decade there in Edmonton. Yeah, a decade at and a time, half. Probably. Decade and a half where you're, you're working at the university. You've only really been working at universities minus that one stint uh, where you're doing crazy work with the, <laughs> getting things to compile. You got your master's. You got your PhD. You finished the PhD. No, I did not. So the university eventually sent me a letter that I had uh, timed out um, many years later. I was already here in San Francisco. So I moved to San Francisco in 2012. What made you move? What What was it that you decided, I'm done here in Edmonton. I'm going to go and go into Silicon Valley, right? I, mean, uh... I didn't even think of it in terms of Silicon Valley. Um, I'd, I'd had interviews with companies in Silicon Valley. Uh, ever since like year 2000, including Google and offers, but I had not accepted any of them. Um, what made me eventually move was the university and many, most of the universities in Canada are public universities as in they're funded by the government um, amongst other things. But uh, University of Alberta always had this, you know, oh, Government is telling us we need to do a 3% reduction in our funding, whatever. And well, there's really only like three pots of money inside the university that there's, you know, the non-academic staff, there's the academic staff, and then there is basically operational funding, like, you know, fix the lights, buy a computer, that sort of stuff. And you can only reduce, you know, the, the things so much. And there's, uh, contracts in place with the academic union that, you know, you can't do certain things. And in the end, that means that the, the, the non-academic uh, staff end up being let go first. Now, I didn't get let go, but you'd get this constant thing every year of like, hey, you know, we might leave, need to let you go and this and that and everything else. And finally, I told my boss, it's like, dude, unless you're going to like do something that directly impacts me, I don't really want to know. I, just let me do my work and, and whatever else, right? And he kept telling me these things. And at some point I told him, look, if you're going to keep telling me this, I'm going to try, I'm going to like go away. I don't want that part. And then uh, he did tell me again and I'm like, okay, fine. Time to find another job. And I had a friend at Twitter that I, that I went to uh, my undergrad, my, my first four years of university, whatever, uh, with who I, you know, kept in contact with and then I basically reached out and said, Hey, you guys got, you guys looking for people? Like you got any jobs? And he's like, yeah, sure. We got this thing. And, you know, and I started looking and that's where I saw SRE and I'm like, yeah, I can do that. So I, I wonder, I wonder if they had these constant conversations of stress just to kind of push people out because I mean, you're basically saying stop and it doesn't stop. I don't think so. Uh, hard, hard to say in in the sense because or it, trying to be a trying to be a good person, trying to give you warnings like yes, hey, this is going to happen. This is going to. I promise you, at some point, it's going to happen. Go, go, go. So, so my my boss, um, who again, he's he's a friend of mine at this point. He he has also retired. We get along well, right? And and we would go out, you know, after work and go grab a beer and. You know, there was, I think at the height, their office was about five or six people. And we'd all, you know, go and grab burgers and beers on Thursday afternoon or something. And we got along well. We figured out who did what and we got the work done type of stuff. So I, I'm assuming then uh, the entire team, especially him, were, were, were kind of happy when you said, hey, I'm take, I just took a job with Twitter in San Francisco. I'm, I'm, I'm heeding the warning. Rod was not happy. Um, he understood, but uh, as he put it, yeah, you know, it's nice to have that headcount freed up. It's not nice to lose somebody who does work. Um, somebody who's been there that long and knew how to to do the work and how to play the game and you know work around budget constraints and mentor 
so I, I was a team lead for a while. Um, I had some people that I basically was responsible for. And, uh, you know, losing that is, it, I, I don't like tapping my back and stuff and say, yeah, I was an awesome employee. I, I don't know, but I was at least worth something. No, you were important. You were important and valuable to them. Twitter must have been a complete shock. Twitter had to be an environment <laughs> that you have never experienced before in your life. I've never worked there. I don't, they don't even use Go over there as far as I know. So I don't even really meet Twitter employees ever in the last 10 years. Twitter or uh, X or whatever that it's called now is, is very, very different than when I got there. It was definitely also different than what I'd been used to at that point. I was likely one of the older uh, people there. Um, my, my boss was likely 10 years younger than me, both of them. Um, my colleague, Joe and I were the two SREs on the internal compute platform. We, we basically made sure that all of the compute clusters kept working and growing and whatever's needed. And he was, I think he had just left Google tech stop, if I remember right. So, you know, maybe 25 i i don't even know exactly but like early mid 20s maybe um we got along really well um i was the bad cop he was the good cop so you know we we got a lot of stuff uh, done but what was the job just to keep keep the computers running for the app so we had we had two systems that were largely uh the things that we were tasked with to keep running and growing running reliably and growing to meet demand. One was a cluster management system called Kubernetes, uh, sorry, Mesos. And there was a job scheduling system on top that was uh, created internally called Aurora. Uh, both of these, if I remember right, were Apache foundation projects at some point, And I think they got sunsetted uh, for both of them, if I remember right. The closest analog today is Kubernetes. Um, and we were running clusters. Let me, I'm gonna interrupt you real quick because I've, I've never learned, I've, I've never understood what this te the, the text, tech stack was over there. So I'm assuming you had your own data centers, you weren't running cloud. And then what's the tech stack over there? What are they building? What are they using for front end, back end? So I do not know what is over there today. Uh, that, that's, you know, big caveat. When I showed up, we had our own data centers or at least we're releasing space and data centers or whatever you want to call it. Not that we built our own, we, you know, rented space in data centers, um, our own hardware that, you know, some of it we bought when I was there, others was already there. Not too long before I got there, the jobs, or if you want to call it the, the processing software, whatever to manage tweets and all these other things was basically on bare metal. So on on top of Linux, I don't even know what they used. I, I assume they used Puppet because that was the config system uh, to deploy some of this stuff. And then the missile stuff came along and then me and Joe came along and the missile stuff. So I remember my first ticket, like in the door, you know, day two or three, um, I'm part of the, I'm embedded with the software development team for these systems. And basically I was given a ticket, Hey, add these many machines to that cluster over there. And I'm like, Hey, I don't know any of the systems, but you know, I, I trust my team in the sense that they're not going to give me something I'm going to fail at. They're going to give me something that I can figure out. Might take me longer or shorter or whatever, but I, I was asking questions, whatever else I can figure it out. And I'm like 1500 machines. Okay, sure. I can figure it out. I've never managed this many machines at once, but sure. <laughs> well, I do one, they could do 15 or 1500, right? And uh, managed to screw that up. <laughs> Added almost 2000 machines, so about 500 that weren't ours. <laughs> um, and then uh, basically this was the beginning of, of uh, you know, the internal cloud computing, whatever you want to call it type of stuff. And the stack was basically Scala with uh, Thrift as the RPC mechanism, um, Zookeeper and company for not just locks, but also service discovery. Um, 
most of it internally handcrafted or grab things from wherever we could find it and then adapt it and basically have an internal, you know, fork or whatever that we owned. And uh, yeah, Mesos was the container orchestration uh, side. Aurora was really the job, you know, Mesos would tell Aurora, which is the scheduling uh, side, hey, I've got, you know, this much free RAM and this much free CPU on this box or this much disk, you know, and Aurora would go, oh, I've got a task over here that fits into that. So, you know, go and run this task over there. How, how long How long were you at Twitter for? Uh, three and a half years, I think. I joined Google after that in 2015. All right. So you're there for three, three and a half years. And then what, uh, I mean, you must be learning a lot because you're, you're really dealing with scale at this point. This is a whole nother level of compute and scale. So Those clusters, they grew with it. So there was a race 20 X growth or, uh, my two year anniversary and the growth beat it by like a week. Like that, that's, you know, it was just, it was go, 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 went through the IPO. So, you know, a lot of that was driven by, hey, we're going to make money, whatever. I was never really part of the money equation other than just providing the resources for whatever money ads, whatever people were running. And they usually came back and said, we need more. And you're like, okay, let me find more. And we go to the observability team and say, hey, we have more. We need to be able to see what's going on. And there they'd be like, uh, okay, well, let me try and figure out how to do that. <laughs> it was, you know, one thing after another. I started teaching and, and mentoring uh, more when I was at Twitter. So getting a bit more involved in hiring and, and uh, after hire. So like teaching new hires and mentoring people, um, presenting some stuff. So what causes you to leave three and a half years later? And how does Google end up on the radar? <laughs> Google and I have a long history. And if I would have uh, changed my answer a couple of times, I would be in a, I would be very retired. Um, so my, my first interview with Google was in year 2000. And back when I, when I was still at University of Alberta. And uh, so I had three interviews of roughly about two years apart, give or take two, three years apart each, um, that I said no to. So they offered you a job and you said no. Three times in a row. Why? The first two times were the compensation wasn't quite there. The third time the compensation was there, but me and the recruiter had a uh, misunderstanding over uh, a communication misunderstanding. Um, and then uh, the next three times I interviewed with Google, they said no. Went through all the interviews, everything went, went to hiring committee, whatever. And then basically it came back as not a fit. And, and, you know, I took it as, hey, I said no three times. They said no three times. So I think we <laughs> them. And then... Uh, Tiff for tat. Yeah, more or less. I doubt it was the case, but who knows, right? Um, and then basically in 2015, I'm like, yeah, I'm ready to move on, right? Uh, Google, and I interviewed at Google, I interviewed at Apple at the same time. Well, I find it interesting that you decided to interview one more time. I, I, I think in my brain, I would have been like, I'm done. Um, I had friends there, right? And and the way, the way you know, I called up some friends at Google and basically said, hey, you know, what's the work like? We'd go out and, you know, for an NDA or whatever you want to call it, you get a bit more information of what the work was like and, you know, the fun things you can do and all the different things. And I was looking at, well, I mean, Google scale is one up from Twitter scale at the time. Right. And there were other places, you know, the cloud flares, the drop boxes, whatever that, that were some of them maybe similar in terms of size, just different from Twitter. That is, um, but, you know, the big ones were, you know, the fangs basically. And I'm like, yeah, sure. I'd love to go work with my friends that are at Google and, you know, do some interesting stuff. And uh, basically called up one of my friends and said, hey, do you know a recruiter that's going to, you know, actually work with me to get me through the door? Because, you know, and I've had this history, right? Three yes, three no. I didn't really want another no. I was wanted somebody who would fight if there was a no and figure out a path forward. 
and I had got a recruiter and basically that's what they did is I went through the interviews. Um, there was one interview that didn't, uh, do too well for whatever reason. And he's like, yeah, would you mind retaking it? I'm like, hell no. Uh, sure. And then instead of doing the interviews here in San Francisco for that one, I went to Mountain View to talk with actually a more senior, uh, engineer and we yeah that interview went really well. And then basically got an offer. And I'm like, yeah, sure. I'll you yeah. know, join Google. And basically in 2015, I joined Google. And you've been there ever since? No, I was out for a year and a half, something like that. I don't quite remember my timelines. And I joined DoorDash for a bit and uh, basically helped DoorDash build an SRE team. So I was their lead SRE for year and a half, two years, that sort of thing. And then uh, missed my old friends, missed my old team at, at Google that I'd been working with before I left and basically made the decision to go back. And then... was it is it hard to go back or you got to start the whole process again? Um, it was hard and not hard. So Google started going right around the time when I decided, hey, uh, I'd love to you know join you all again. I let my old team manager know that about a week after he had moved his open headcount to Ireland, I think, to Dublin. Uh, so he didn't have an open headcount. And I'm like, ah, crap, can you claw it back? And he's like, nope, it's gone. So you know, <laughs> but, you know, Google has open headcount at the time. So I, I did the interview process. And since I was nominally going back to roughly the same job, it was more of a... It was treated almost like an internal transfer. So, you know, you're interviewing with a new team type of stuff. Um, and uh, the interview process was abbreviated, not as, as big as before. And then uh, fast forward into the summer, a couple of years ago now, where Google went into a hiring freeze. So I, <laughs> I literally had my application at, the the hiring committee when <laughs> they went into a hiring freeze and for the next month and a half or two i was in limbo it was like well they said they had got an offer for me but the freeze means they can't send it to me <laughs> they're going what's next so but you're still at doordash i'm still at doordash at that point and then uh you know finally you know things worked out in the end where there was a position on a different team the team i'm on now and uh you know offers and other things like that and i i went back um and have been there since and you know there's layoffs happening and stuff all over the place nowadays so sometimes you're under uh, how long am i going to be there hopefully until i retire but we'll see i'm, I'm curious what you thought doordash was going to be that you left google for that to be blunt, every once in a while, somebody tosses enough money at you that you stop and say, okay, now I've got to take it serious. So I had gotten into the habit of just going out and doing an interview or two every so often. Part of it is fear because I, I'm older. I start wondering, am I still relevant in a world of where companies can hire 20 year olds for half my price or less. And, and, you know, they'll work 60, 70, 80 hours a week and produce way more than I think I ever will. Uh, am I still desirable? So I go out and I try an interview and see, you know, can I get my yes type of thing? And it, it's a fear driven thing. And then, uh, that was what I was going through. Uh, I don't remember where all I interviewed. A uh, good number of them were no's in the end, but a friend of mine basically said, hey, we're hiring at DoorDash. Uh, why don't you interview here? And I'm like, okay, sure. And the original thing was, uh, I don't think it's going to be anything. And I just, you know, went through the interview process and at the offer stage, I got, you know, got a yes. And then at the offer stage, um, they said, well, what are your salary expectations? And I gave them a number, which I thought was ridiculous. And then they came back with uh, six figures above that. I'm like, uh, this was supposed to be like an exercise that I can throw away in the end, but they're serious. 
and then I, you know, had more conversations with, you know, their, their head of engineering and other people. And I'm like, okay, a, the money is almost ridiculous. And the work looked like something I hadn't fully done, but was interested in trying. And they thought I had the skills to do it. And I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll give it a shot. But in the end, after a year and a half, two years, the, the money just wasn't worth whatever it is you were doing anymore. The money was definitely helpful. So it helped me shore up more of my retirement, if you wish. I, my retirement. But it wasn't enough to keep you there. It wasn't enough to keep you there. Um, it wasn't. But it wasn't what drove me away in some sense. What pulled me in back, if you wish, was I was missing my friends and the people I had worked with before. Not saying that I didn't meet good people at DoorDash. I, I also made friends. <laughs> in the end, it was also hard to leave. Um, but I, the team I had worked on at Google was something rather special. I really missed that part. Um, and I missed some of the tooling. So Google's tooling is, I haven't seen anything like it. It's integrated everywhere. Um, whereas DoorDash was more along the lines of, if it's not your core business, buy it, don't build it, right? So mm, I guess this is more common, if you wish, in most of the tech companies. I'm, generalizing i haven't seen most of them where oh you need a, an observability stack okay you go and get you know some observability vendor to give you something and buy for it and you need logging oh you get Splunk or whatever and, and you get all of these things and you sort of mash them together it's all integration you know they all sort of integrate with each other in some some fashion maybe maybe you have to do a bit of work but in many ways they don't integrate with your company they integrate with each other and, and I found part of that, of my job, somewhat frustrating. So I also missed the opportunities that I'd had at Google. So at Google, I, I was part of the Go community. Uh, I did internal Go tips where every week we would publish a, sort of a one pager on like Go, some, some aspect of Go. Um, I was a Go readability reviewer and I could get people through the readability process to also be readability reviewers. I was working with the university outreach uh, people to go and present, you know, at my old university and other places for, you know, come work at Google. This is what we do. And, you know, I talk about my work at Google and basically help do mock interviews and, you know, AMAs were yeah you missed you missed all the extracurricular activity stuff that you were doing too because I I missed all of that and all those opportunities. Um, DoorDash didn't have as big of a engine, if you wish, to to make some of this thing happen, right? And then, unfortunately, you know, pandemic and all of that stuff, even Google shut down a, a good chunk of all of it. All, all that's fair. I want to get back to one thing you said, right? This idea as we get older, because I have the same, I've had the same sort of fear for at least 15 years now, right? Um, at some point, do I age out of being able to get a job because I'm at a certain age, right? I'm not hireable anymore. And everybody can say that doesn't exist. It's, it, it's always in my head to the point where I've spent the last maybe 15 years trying to live at a certain salary level that I know that if the world came to an end, I think I could get a job at this salary level and try not to live beyond it. <laughs> right. As, as you grow older, right. I, I talked to, to some of my younger colleagues and I'm like, you know, you're fresh at a university college, whatever, this is your first or second job. And I talked to them about, you know, what a good chunk, like, we pay you good money, obviously pay off your school debts or whatever, if you have them. But after that, like take advantage of all of the 401ks and backdoor Roths and whatever else there is, right. And put your money away as early and as, as quickly as you can, because 
when you get to 40, you start thinking about retirement. It's, it's sort of a, just a nugget. It's like, yeah, 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 I'm only 40, whatever. And I feel like I'm 20. It's okay. And then you get to 50 and you're like, it's a lot closer than I thought it was. <laughs> and, you know, and that, that fear does start to build a bit. It's really built around the, the, the percent of salary that you live on, right? You can't be living on 80%. You might have to in your 20s. Because it's just hard starting out, but you got to get that down to way below 50%. So not way, but at least below 50% at some point. I, I would argue that if you, you know, if we're, we're in a very privileged situation from, from many people, right? We, we make an exorbitant amount of money, usually doing something we really like. Um, but that extra 20% that you might have in your 20s um, is so much more valuable if you take that and invest it and, and be smart with it, then the same 40 or 50% in your later 40s, early 50s, that the time you don't have time on your side anymore, right? Whereas early on, you have time and the ability to take some risks and those can pay off huge, right? The one thing I found, and, and I actually have a question for you, um, I found that Teaching at the university when I was there, you know, helping to teach, TA and so on, um, teaching and, and doing that type of activity at Twitter and at Google has, I feel it has kept me young. Maybe not as young as somebody in college, but I feel like I'm, I don't know, I, I don't feel as old as I do right now where I haven't done that for a while. So it always feels like that is where I want to get back to. And, and I see you teaching, I see you going out to conferences and, and workshops and so on. And I'm like, funny enough, that's my dream. <laughs> <laughs> Just got to put a class together, man. Got to put a class together. And uh... you're, you're sitting here telling me earlier that, you know, the, that SRE and so on is something you're, you're curious about, something that's always intrigued you. And I'm like, well, <laughs> actually, it's the other way around for me, <laughs> where uh, maybe if I retire, quote unquote, um, I'll do some teaching. I don't know. <laughs> that was the original uh, retirement plan for me was actually get my PhD just because that makes it easier to go and teach at a university. A lot of them require sort of PhD credentials at least. And what I was looking at doing was finding some country that, that maybe wasn't as well off as, as, you know, Europe and North America type like, Canada, US, Japan, you know, the, the rich countries, if you wish, but find a place that isn't quite as well off, a university that can't afford to pay a whole bunch, but the cost of living is more reasonable and just go teach. I don't know if I've ever shared this on the on the podcast. I don't, I don't think it has to be a secret, but I, at Arden, we've built, a, we've built a, a, an engine. We've built a marketing and sales engine there. And so if there is somebody with the interest in, in teaching and they have a class that's about, I would say, at least 20 hours, right? It, you basically want to be able to be eight hours a day for three days with breaks, okay? Um, what we do is real simple. We go 50% with our instructors. So if you've got the material in a class, we'll promote it. We'll put it out there. We'll try to get you a, a, a cor corporate audience there. And then at the end of the day, you just have to walk in and, and take your 50%, right? Like, and, and, and we do the other. And um, again, again, no secrets here. Uh, we've learned, I've learned that corporate budgets, a, a $30,000 $30, for a three-day class is kind of right where these budgets are. So you just start doing the math. I mean, you do two, if you could get to a point where you have a class that's in demand by corporate, and this, by the way, it takes a year of doing workshops at conferences to get there. So it's not overnight, but you could do two classes a month. You can make 30,000 a month without even blinking an eye, right? Um, at least with our, with our engine. Maybe I'll uh, reach out at some point. That... It's always in the back of my mind, like, do I start my own thing? Do I not? You know, work takes a lot out of you. So having the extra time, you know, do you spend it chilling or do you spend it working more? But if you've got ideas for, for classes that you think corporate companies, teams and companies would, would really 
gain a lot of value. That's the thing, right? And you test these classes out at workshops and conferences. And then, you know, I've just spent the last almost two years on my new software design class. It's finally now, after two years, really picking up. I've done some corporate stuff, but I expect this year to be to be much better. Well, I, I, I wish you all the luck and, and success on that one. I, I have looked at it. I, I like what I see. It, it's very structured is, is the one, one thing I can say about it, which, you know, some people need and, and like, but it, it's definitely straightforward and, and shall we say uh, all encompassing or definitely expansive. Um, and opinionated. I, I think as a teacher, it is, it is. you have to be opinionated, flexible, flexible, opinionated, right? You can't be a rock, um, but you got to be opinionated. It makes a certain amount of sense to present, if you wish, a way. And, and that usually sparks some amount of conversation and then you can take that back and either you know change things integrate that or you know it's it's somebody who decides hey i i looked at your way i think i'm gonna go this other way and it's like you do you like that's what this is for right the one of the first things i say in class is you don't have to agree with everything that i say in fact the world would be boring if you did so i don't expect you to agree with me 100 percent but if you only agree with me like 10%, this is probably not the class for you because <laughs> we're really on two different planes of existence. Um, but I, I would say I get probably 60 to 70% of uh, people agreeing because everybody's experience is different. Everybody's systems are different. Everybody's constraints are different. Exactly. And and I'm, I'm at the point where I'm, well, over the last 10 years or so, slowly realizing that just because we disagree or have a different viewpoint or we, we come from different backgrounds um, doesn't necessarily mean that it's not valuable, right? It's like you do, you implement your technology stack certain way, or you've made certain decisions. And, you know, at one point, at least it was working for you. Maybe it's still working for you, you know, more power to you. Um, a lot of my jobs over the last, you know, 10 plus years, I, end up in a situation where I look at a system and go, well, this is broken. It doesn't work now. Right. And then the first thing I usually do is I, I go talk to the people who are a managing it or who even built it, if they're still around and basically say, Hey, can you give me a history lesson? Like just ha ha have a beer, coffee, tea, whatever is, is your poison. And basically say, you know what? Like, please unload on me, give me like all of the frustrations and like, why are people not using the system correctly the way it was meant to be designed and used or like, give me a history lesson. How did it come to be? Why is this thing here? And I've usually found sometimes that they're a little bit skeptical because they've been abused, right? They've got this system that everybody depends on and it's not working well for anybody and they're trying their best to try and make it work. But, you know, the original design was 10 years ago or more and the the uh scale that it was designed for is nowhere near what it is today so it's it's outlived its you know useful life twice over and it's it's now being used for something completely different than what its original intention was and you know there's there's a mismatch there but you get a person like that to actually explain to you where it came from and you start to see that they made the best choice that they made with the information they had in the situation they were in. You know, they, they weren't bad engineers. They weren't, you know, sloughing off or whatever else. They cared and they, they made the best choices. And it's just that, you know, the world has changed and so on. I try to teach this in the class that when you look at something and you're like, what drugs were they on at the time they did this? Yeah, you have to remember that there aren't necessarily bad engineers. They're good engineers in bad situations. So the best part is I've had that reaction, like, holy crap, what are drugs for they on? Please share. And I found that getting that history lesson is actually that drug because, A, you, you, you get now a colleague that when you go back and you ask them for, for a favor later on, they're likely going to help you because you sat there and listened to them. And the stories are awesome. You'll, you'll have stories you would have never in your wildest imagination dreamt of or thought of where, 
you know, this system was created because before they were tracking who owned what machine and email. And you're like, how the hell did that work? <laughs> and now this whole system is an automation system that drives like configurations for machines. And you're like, you mean it was just a thing to track who owned what machine? <laughs> and he's like, yes. And I'm like, holy crap. I try to teach this stuff. I, 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 I try to share this even early on in the class. I try to, I try to share it. I, I like SRE, but I don't know how well that would work in a corporate setting, right? If that sort of thing, it's, it, I feel it's like a niche thing, even though there's likely more of us than I know about. I more and more, I like this, you know, the, the book that was given to me and, and told, Hey, you need to do, write a book report on this thing. Like, you know, win friends and influence people. More and more, I'm I'm starting to think that, you know, how how do I teach people about relationship management? How do I teach them about the career aspects of it? How do I teach them about how do you manage a coworker who you don't get along with, or a boss you maybe don't see eye to eye with, or you know, how how do you mentor a bunch of people through different aspects of their career? Um, if I ever get the time and I have somebody who can help edit and make, make my random ramblings actually comprehensible, maybe I'll start working. Dude, I'll read anything you got. You can always send it over to me. But yeah, writing is the, writing is the key. It's easy to kind of talk about stuff up front, but when you have to write something down, there's no context. So you, it, it, it gets really technical. And then you have a better sort of talk in front of you, right? Uh, writing's everything, and it's hard, super hard. We are totally out of time. Actually, we're like <laughs> almost two, we're almost two hours in, and I could easily talk to you for another hour. But I'll gladly talk to you more. So if you ever have the time and want to chat, by all means, doesn't have to be you know on video. I don't. I I enjoy catching up with people. It was finally great to meet you. I think this is the first time we meet face to face. Yeah, 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 for sure. We've uh, interacted on Twitter a bit here and there, and I think that's about it. You haven't been going to any of the Go conferences, right? Have you ever thought about going to a Go conference? Maybe this year? Um, I went to GopherCon in, where was that? It would have been Denver, Chicago, San Diego. Denver. I went to GopherCon there. And I haven't been back since. Um, this is the 10 year. This is a 10 year anniversary this year. So I'm right on the edge of, uh, do I want to travel during? that type of travel during COVID. I'm still a bit on the on the cautious side. Um, I do go into the office now pretty much every day. Um, but uh, yeah, there's travel I still haven't quite done yet. Hopefully in the next year-ish, I'll get over that. Um, and hopefully things improve to the point where that is, is better. But yeah, I missed the conferences that I used to go to. I had like GCP Next and GopherCon and various sort of meetup type groups um, that I used to go and either hang out or, you know, present something or whatever. Yeah, well, maybe this is the year you can start start slowly. But we are out of time, Toby. So if anybody wants to reach out to you after listening to the show today, what's the best way for them to reach out? Uh, depends on context. So, um, they're welcome to, you know, chat at me on Twitter or X. Um, I have an email address that's fairly easy to find. And of course, by all means, uh, send me an email. Um, if it's job related, then, you know, LinkedIn is usually where I get started on that. Although that moves the email pretty quick. Um, any one of those things, um, the only thing I ask is, please don't call me. <laughs> <laughs> How they get, your number is public. <laughs> uh, if you search enough, you'll find you'll find a number or two that might still work. That's funny. My number is public too because we used it for the business. But the iPhone has a feature where the phone doesn't ring. If I don't have. I don't know the number. That works really well. Uh, have to start discovering some of that. The thing is, I also. My iPhone is the thing that like alerts me when bad stuff happens at work. So there's a fine line between how much I turn on and how much I turn off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's fair. <laughs> um, All right. 
All right. So we'll get all that in the show notes. But um, again, I really appreciate it, man. We almost talked for two hours. Kevin, Kevin's the, the person uh, on the program that edits everything. Kevin's got his work cut out for him for the show, but it was awesome. Let me know if you need anything else. I really enjoyed talking to you and uh, Kevin earlier as well. Yeah, I'm open for talks and all of that. Brilliant. So this is Toby, uh, the Nutty Swiss on Twitter X, and Bill Kennedy signing off, and hope to see everybody again real soon.